Aliza, let's talk about some of the negative impacts of, of our toxic conflicts first. Well, I mean, I think the good news, I, I, I'll give a little good news, but then I agree, we, you know, we, we do need to understand it can be so harmful to be in high conflict, to be witness to high conflict relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's much worse for kids than divorce. So that's like full stop. The re there's no research to say that high conflict marriages should stay together for the kids because divorce is bad for kids. That's a misunderstanding of the research. Divorce is bad for kids when there's high conflict divorce. It's yeah. conflict well, actually, the Actually, the research shows that if you stay married and you have a high conflict marriage, that's the worst thing for the kids. Right, because now there's not even a, a space between the conflict and the Hi, and welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today we're going to talk about conflict and your kids. And I was saying to our guest before I introduced her, I was saying to her, uh, the reason why I want to explore this topic is people have a lot of funny ideas about conflict and kids. You know, if we just, if we do it quietly, they'll never know. Or it's okay for us to, to yell and scream because that's what people do. There's all kinds of ideas that people have. And the truth is that any kind of difference that we resolve in a way that feels negative or toxic to us is probably hasn't got an ideal impact on them. And so we're going to talk about some of the ways that we impact our children with conflict and you know ways to get to helping them be more resilient and manage conflict better as they develop and grow. And today I am speaking with Dr. Aliza Pressman. She's a developmental psychologist with over 15 years of experience in family work. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm great. I want to call you Eliza like my aunt. Everybody does. Everybody, Everybody does. <laughs> I was like, it's not Eliza. And you know, and then your unconscious mind says, What do you mean there's no pink elephant? All I see is a pink <laughs> elephant. She like, immediately you become Eliza. But you Everybody know, calls me that. <laughs> it's crazy. You are Eliza. I am Eliza, but my even my college advisor for four years just couldn't get it. And like I've dated people who accidentally would say Eliza mid after months. It's just like I think people really fight the urge, but it is Eliza. <laughs> well, it's much better than if they call you mom while they're dating you. So that's true. That's true. Dad, <laughs> we're dead. So Lisa, the question I ask everyone on the front end is, how did your heart lead you into this incredible work that you do with children and families? Well, I was actually doing theater in my early 20s. And so I was doing some volunteer work, trying to do theater with kids whose moms were uh, working with social workers and, and other therapists in abuse cases, domestic violence cases. And I was like, I wanna work with kids. Like this feels so meaningful. And then I Googled um, like theater and kids, like careers, cause I was in my early twenties and you know, thinking about the, my purpose and everything. And I found out there was a thing called drama therapy. And I was like, what, that's so cool. And, but it happened to be in the middle of the school year, the semester. So I went and had a meeting with the head of the department at NYU. And he was like, well, you can't apply, you can't start graduate school now, but you could take some prerequisites or coursework in the field. And he suggested I take kind of the basics, abnormal psychology, social psychology, group dynamics, and developmental psychology. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, all right, I had no, I was a, I did art history and literature in college. So I was absolutely not, I knew nothing about psychology, but then I started like in, like, as if I was speed dating, I just started these classes in preparation for applying to graduate school. And I just, fell in love with Eric Erickson and John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth and all these people that mean nothing to anyone listening, but they were like the Brad Pitt and Meryl Streep of this field. And I thought how we come to be who we are is what I want to understand. And then I want to help support 
in this in the ways that we actually can help support growing healthy people um i wanted to make that a part of my life so then i never did drama therapy <laughs> i went right into developmental psych but it was a very like i just fell in love like intellectually and emotionally i didn't have kids and i wasn't you know i i it was a strange field to go into without actually having kids um and then once i had children i had my first baby and i was writing my dissertation by then because it's like a seven thousand year program and i um you, really you don't, you don't look like you've been through seven thousand years of program just so you know. <laughs> But I get it. It took a long time. <laughs> but it took a long time. So at that point, I was married. I had my first child. And I was like, oh, it's so wild to me how there's so much research and then how it gets translated in the world or on the playground or from in-laws or just like whispers is not necessarily accurate and sometimes harmful. And so I thought it would be cool to help translate all the beautiful research that's out there so that it, it can directly support families. I had originally thought I was going to go into social policy and make legal, you know, kind of talk about development in terms of how we can support children and families in our communities. And then I got more interested in actual individual families and other ways to reach them through healthcare systems, et cetera, later, just after I had my own little babies. Got it. And now you have a private practice. Mm -hmm. But I only work with parents. I don't actually, I won't work with, I'll swap out specialties and I'll probably, when my kids go to college in a few years, I will re-specialize and want to work with kids. But my mother told me, as like just a t hot tip, pro tip from her, cause she was an educator. She was like, it was hard teaching kids all day and then coming home and being an engaged mom. Uh. So I took that very seriously. And I was like, then I will work with parents. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, uh, actually I have a lot of identification with that. A lot of the work that I do over here at Rich in Relationship is actually all the work that I do is with parents in like different circumstances to help them have more joyful and resilient relationships so that their children are not collateral damage or caught in the middle, but are front and center and properly cared for and also have joyful and resilient lives. And, and the reason is that as we were talking about the show, I, I've had a passel of them and the last one just kind of went off to college. And it's interesting because I've been thinking more and more about you know, I'm not sure enough people are actually doing work with adolescents or with kids. No, and, there's a huge shortage. They really have my heart, you know, so it's something I think about. I totally get that. Um, and today's episode, the reason why we're talking about conflict in kids, besides that Elisa is like got mad, deep education and experience <laughs> in this area, is also that um, I'm I'm surprised often at how hopeful parents are about the impact of their conflicts on their children. You know, and and uh, I almost think it's like we have, a, as parents, we start to develop denial about the impact of our conflicts on our children. Maybe it's healthy denial. You know, Maybe if we knew how much we were hurting them, we'd wanna go jump off the top of a building or something. And that's kind of, when I got divorced I, or decided to get divorced, I stopped the first time because I realized, oh my God, my children are suffering I so did. much. Right. You know, and, and it took a long time before I realized that they were suffering even more uh, with the way that my wife at the time and I were behaving and that that was going to be worse for them in the long run. So, you know, there may be kind of, there's certainly a, kind, a form of denial, not healthy denial. And I think that the other side of it is that we have a view culturally that conflict is a negative. Yeah. Um, and that, and more and more, we seem to live in a society that says, you know, if you have a difference, call in outside help because you are not equipped to deal with it. You know, you need the, an arbitrator, a mediator, the police, a lawyer, a therapist, a family counselor, and you may need those things. It's true. But there's also the other side of it, which is 
I'm going to shut up after this. I promise you, Aliza. No. The other, the other side of it is that nothing new happens without difference, right? If we were all the same, it would be one monochromatic, really boring, freaking boring. world. And Very nothing boring. new would come out of it. So difference is vital to having something new, new and exciting and vibrant. And we all like new and exciting and vibrant. What we don't like is toxic and stultifying and killing. You know, and so yeah. how do we, um, number one, get that conflict or that res difference resolution has an impact on our children? And how do we shift it? The Really, the question is, how are we going to shift it from negative to positive? And I'm, that was a really long introduction into Aliza. Let's talk about some of the negative impacts of, of our toxic conflicts first. Well, I mean, I think the good news I, I i'll give a little good news but then i agree we you know we, we do need to understand it can be so harmful to be in high conflict to be witness to high conflict relationships mm -hmm. and it's much worse for kids than divorce so that's like full stop the re there's no research to say that high conflict marriages should stay together for the kids because divorce is bad for kids. That's a misunderstanding of the research. Divorce is bad for kids when there's high conflict divorce. It's yeah. conflict well, actually, the actually the research problem. shows that if you stay married and you have a high conflict marriage, that's the worst thing for the kids. Right, because now there's not even a, a space between the conflict and ever. And the message is that this is, you know, you tough it out when it's actually harmful. So. There's no benefit to doing that. And then the second worst thing is to be in a high conflict divorce. And so kids need not to be protected from the idea that people don't necessarily agree all the time. That would be super disturbing and boring, but they need to be protected from our inability to regulate ourselves in those um, disagreements. And so like, the harm, it comes in different forms. And I don't love, you know, I don't want to focus too much on the harm, except to sell anyone on the idea that it's harmful, which is if you want your kid to be self-regulated and you cannot get yourself self-regulated, meaning your emotions take over, not just to give you information, which emotions are really great for, but they take over and flood your resources. So you have no capacity to make good decisions about those feelings and, and what you wanna do with them. You're not self-regulated and then you cannot expect your child to be self-regulated. You know, the biggest association we have, the biggest predictor of self-regulated kids is self-regulated parents. So that's the first thing. And we know that self-regulation is one of the largest factors that goes into resilience. Well, may, may I challenge you a little? Sure. I, I have three cultures that that come to me and say, this is how I grew up. And they tend to be Greek, Italian, and Chinese. Well, add Jewish, because that's mine. Okay, all right, four. Yeah, this, that we grew up, this, this is what we do, we fight. There's not a problem with fighting. And so I'm glad you said that. Fighting, even yelling, when it's not threatening sounding, when it's culturally appropriate, because you come from like, for example, if you didn't speak English and you were just watching my father's side of the family interacting at a family meal, you would think everybody was screaming at each other the whole time. But it's the tone that they use in the family that they live in and everybody is aware of the tone. It's not startling and scary. It's not unpredictable. And it's not born of uh, trying to undermine or diminish or control. It's actually just like a loud family. Mm -hmm. And so even when there's yelling and I'm so mad at you, it's in the context of a family that understands that that's how they speak to each other and they repair in front of each other. So you're not witnessing just people out of the blue fighting. You're witnessing a different tone. That's not, that's not the same thing as the other possibility, which is a family that never learned how to fight in a way that is productive, in a way that is regulated enough to come to repairs. And 
it becomes abusive. That, of course, is it's just even if you did grow up with that, you need to reparent yourself and figure out a new way if you're interested in building kids who can come into this world as self-regulated adults. It's a really interesting point that you bring up about tonality. And I think we sort of connects to um, a distinction we're making here a lot is there's like the being of it and the doing of it. You know, so you can, you can do very quietly some really toxic stuff. Totally. You know, it's not necessarily about whether it's loud or quiet. It's about where you're coming from. You know, yeah. I, I've got several clients who are really seethingly, boilingly angry, but they deliver it with such sharp quietness that it's yeah. ter it's terrifying. terrifying. It's actually and scarier than someone who's like, ah, I'm a little mad, let me tell you about it. Okay, I'm done with that, let's move exactly. on. Exactly, you know? exactly. And that's so important because kids need safety above all else. They need safety, emotional safety, and physical safety. If they're not safe, you can't do any of the other stuff. And humans seek safety. So if they're feeling threatened, they can't learn. Mm -hmm. They can't feel, they can't feel like anything is possible. And they'll adjust and adapt everything around finding ways to feel safe in whatever context they're in. So if your yelling and screaming and fighting is in this way that is like your second version that you just did, I'm mad and I'm, you just, t you just ruined dinner and I'm so annoyed and blah, blah, blah. And then, all right, sorry. Okay. You guys know that I always lose my shit when, you know, I get nervous about dinner and I'm, I'm so sorry. And everybody's it's not, laughing. It's not about you. It's uh, just me. It's not, yeah. Something. This is a me problem, it's not a, lot a you different problem. Than, I'm not angry. And you made yeah. me this way. <laughs> exactly. So it's so much more important to make sure that kids can predict what's going on. And when they have those predictions that you name it, so you don't go, we're not fighting. I'm not mad. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. Because then they can't trust their own gut because what they're imagining is happening and what you're saying is happening are two different things. And so then they question themselves or what their understanding of the world is. There's lots of harm in that. And if you start fighting and don't kind of finish the loop in front of kids and go off in private because you're and you're proud, like we don't fight in front of the kids, you're fighting in front of the kids. You're just not resolving it in front mm -hmm. of the kids. So all of those things are much more harmful than um, just like, a tone issue and and it really comes down to safety is this in the context of a safe loving household or is this and is this just like oh god my, like my kids know a day not to irritate me is a travel day I, i'm not great with travel days i'm just not great with travel days so if they start to like needle me what what would normally make me laugh or normally make me pause and do something, I'm like, guys, you know this is not the day to do this. Uh -huh. And they know that it's not the day to do this. And typically it ends up like with laughter because I'm such a like caricature of myself. But that's because they're safe to know that if they did laugh when I'm like flipping my lid, that it's, I'm, I'm going to realize that I just, I, it's a totally different thing. So they, than, they know where the lines are. They know what the response, there's a predictability about it. It's a, there is, there just is. And so if you're walking on eggshells, cause you don't know when or where the, the, the scary stuff is happening, that's much worse. So all of that is to say that it's not the arguments or the disagreements, though, if you're finding that they're more often than not, something's going wrong and it's not great, but it's really in the expression of them and the way you explain them and how you resolve them. And I wouldn't want any kid growing up in a perfectly, like, like where everybody communicates so perfectly in the household and there is just not one little fight so that they end up going off into the world and they have a relationship and they have their first conflict and they're like, well, I guess that's it then. Because they don't know that you can have disagreements. That shit and, happens. 
<laughs> yeah, shit just happens. And it doesn't mean that those underneath it, there isn't a permanence to the steadiness of the ground. It's just like the feelings were temporarily uglier than you thought they got. So it sounds like, um, number one, we're all going to have feelings. Right? Yes. <laughs> and, and it's important to express them in a way that's healthy and understandable. Uh, and has and, and so that the feelings are complete and resolved also. And sometimes uh, couples have fights and the feelings never get resolved. The, the conflict is never fully resolved and the feeling goes on and on. And even, even when the fight stops, right. you, can, you can feel it. And I've had some couples who think who say, well, we don't do that in front of the kids so they don't know about it. And you know what I want you to know is everybody knows. Uh, everybody feels it on some level. They feel it. They may not speak it. It may not be on the top of their conscious mind there, but unconsciously, you know, we're all plugged into each other and we can feel it when the pot's boiling. You know, if the, if my dog is in the room and my wife and I are a little edgy with each other, the dog starts yawning, uh, which is by the way, for dogs, it's not boredom, it's anxiety. And then the dog comes to one of us, whichever one is most, comfort. Um, most agitated actually for comfort because he wants to also comfort the person who's most agitated, you know, and kids are not, though they, they're <clears throat> not as hardwired as my dog is. You know, my dog's been bred. There've been thousands of years of breeding golden retrievers that have that sensitivity and to respond that way. That's like what goldens are bred for. They're mm -hmm. bred to retrieve and to soothe people. That's like their two functions in life and to shed hair endlessly um, is a side <laughs> effect of that. But you know, our kids are, are at least as sensitive as our dang dogs are, you know? Yeah, you know, I always feel like when people say the, you know, it's very common to say, you can't make me feel a certain way. Like that's an empowering thing to say, but it's also absolutely nonsense because anybody who's walked into a room where there's tension or sobbing or screaming or laughing knows that they feel like they, they have some sense of the feelings that are going on in the room and they get a little bit of those feelings. So mm -hmm. you can't watch six people crying and not feel empathy. I mean, usually, and you can't watch six people laughing hysterically and not catch a little bit of the laughter, even if you don't know what the joke was. Yeah. So kids catch feelings just simply because they have nervous systems that are incredibly aware and attuned. And so if you aren't naming them again, it just makes them, question or imagine and imagination in kids is quite extraordinary and they might imagine something far worse mm. if you don't explain yourself so i think the only other point would be if you don't resolve the conflict if you just can't to name that too like just naming for kids what's going on hey you might have noticed that we were fighting about x y or z it can be really scary when mom and dad fight or mom and mom or dad and dad or whomever and if you have any questions, let us know. But this has nothing to do with you. We love you and we love each other. But we don't agree on this one thing that we've been fighting about. And we're going to figure out a way to resolve it. But we haven't yet. Like, just name that. And I, I'd i prefer that not to have to be explained because it would be so nice if we didn't have these unresolved conflicts that things weren't going on. And I'm uh, absolutely not suggesting you bring your child into your conflict or say like, here's what, dad just does not understand what I need. And what I need is no, because they, we take care of them. They don't take care of us. We do not need to engage them in our adult stuff. We just need to name what's happening in front of their face. Yeah, actually, uh... That one of the problems with gray divorce is that people think because their kids are grown up, it is then okay to bring them in as arbitrators or as counselors. Yeah. It's actually worse, even worse then than when you bring them in when they're young. And really, ideally, children should never have that burden. They, No matter what age they are, they still get to be your kids. Yeah. And I think to, just to remember that no matter how close you are, they're not your best friend. They don't need you. That's That's a you know, a two-way relationship where you care for each other. They should not be caring for our emotions. They should feel deeply confident that we have us, like I've got me, I know how to take care of me through all my different challenging feelings, and I've got you. So you just have to worry about you and I'll worry about you. And that's that. And what complicates this is I think that very often children feel 
responsible. And not yeah. and that's not rational. They're no. sitting there thinking, they love you. Oh, mommy and daddy are upset. It must be me. They feel on some level because they're connected. They feel on some level responsible, which yeah. makes that conversation even more important so that they understand that they are not. Okay. So we're, you know, we're being open and transparent with our children. We're having our emotions all the way through to the end so that we have some form of resolution. How do we teach our children about the value of, uh, I'm going to call it resolving differences, which is just a watered down way of saying conflict. <laughs> um, well, I think, oh my, I'm so sorry. Oh, you're very popular. <laughs> um, so one thing to keep in mind, and this is kind of hokey, but I always say it is all feelings are welcome. All behaviors are not. So being able to honor someone else's feelings and your own feelings and tell your kids, like, that's what we're doing here. We're figuring out how we feel and that's okay. Like feelings don't have to be good or bad. They're challenging. Mm -hmm. They're, some are more challenging. Some are less challenging. I don't need to sell this one, but there's also the sense that certain ways of behaving are not okay. And so you're trying to figure out a way to express your feelings and get your needs met and feelings just kind of let us know what we need, what matters to us without acting in a way that's harmful to another person. And as you get better at communicating, you get better at sharing the idea that the feelings are okay, but the behaviors may not be. Mm. And it's, it's, it's something that kids have to deeply understand because it would be so shaming to say to a child, you can't feel or you should feel a particular way. Also, it's not possible. Like in no universe can you should a person into feeling a certain way. You can get them to like never tell you how they actually feel, but you can't will them into it. Yeah. So I think that that part of it is important to, to, so that it's not bad to say, I have, I'm angry right now, or I'm frustrated, or I'm disappointed in the fact that nobody's done the dishes all week except for me. And also, it doesn't mean I can throw the pot at somebody. You're a mind reader. I was just emptying the dishwasher before this call. I didn't <laughs> throw the pot though, I swear. I mean, but that's the thing. Yes. Yeah. It's get, putting it out there in a way that's responsible. Mm -hmm. And that's just practice and we get to practice and we are going to mess up and then we can get back up and dust our clothes off and start again. And that's the beauty of repair. Like every part of resilience is also being able to have those ruptures and repairs. That's Edtronic's work. Just there's constant ruptures and repairs in relationships. And the, the important thing is the repair. And if you don't go back to repair. Well, there's, or, there's no, there's no resilience. If, the, if there exactly. is a rupture. And, and it's just rupture, 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 rupture until it breaks. Yeah. Well, but I mean, if there's no rupture either, there's no resilience. Right. It's, it's exactly. Like resilience there's no growth. Not, is, is, is learning from growing and expanding. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's kind of like exercise. You know, if you have to tear the muscle to make it grow kind of thing. Exactly. And if it's too easy, you're not really getting any benefit. But if it's too hard, you're going to be on your back. Love it. I love it. Alisa, how can people find you? Um, I am most easy to find on Instagram on at Raising Good Humans podcast. And you can also email at Raising Good Humans. No, Raising Good Humans podcast at gmail.com. Or go to wherever you listen to podcasts and just plug in Raising Good Humans and there it will be. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. And all that stuff will be in the podcast and video blog notes if you didn't get that the first time. So don't, don't sweat it. And if you still can't find it, direct message us. We're going to make sure that you know how to get to Elisa's podcast and her blog and all her good stuff. Thank the you. Question I, well, asked I guess I'm on Substack. As of this week, I forgot about that. Cool. <laughs> it's question, all raising good humans. The question we ask, I love that name, raising good humans. Um, the question I ask everyone at the end of the show is what's the legacy you'd like to leave behind? 
um, well that we can all do our part by raising good humans and also we that we can feel a little bit more hopeful because there is something in our control which is our we are in our control so if people just have that sense i think in this very uncertain world it it can make you feel like okay i can do this i can make a difference i love that i love that it reminds me of uh be the change you want to see you know, exactly. instead of stressing out about other people or or countries or yeah. things that are beyond your control, just manage what you can. Manage what you can. And then we're all connected. And so inevitably that will, I mean, not to get to kumbaya, but that will heal the world. But we got to just start with what we can control. I'm good with kumbaya. <laughs> Thank you so much. Enjoy your wonderful sunny day. And I hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.